Well, welcome to Local 5 Special Town Hall, coping with coronavirus. I am Stephanie Engelson. I am so happy that you are joining us tonight and willing to hear from experts about your mental health. You made the right decision to sit down tonight. Well, we are live from the Polk County Health Department in downtown Des Moines. Uh, Polk County's Emergency Operations Center was activated in early March in response to COVID-19, but the operation uh, has a high priority of mental health as well as physical health. So we're going to talk a little bit about both tonight. We have local mental health experts here to answer your questions live about COVID-19 and how to cope with everything that's going on. We know that your plate is very full right now and if you're like just about anybody else, you're feeling the stress. So we want to talk to you about that tonight. I'd like to introduce our panel. We are so lucky to have all of you here tonight. We have Mary Thompson, who's the CEO of Clive Behavioral Health Services with Mercy One. Dr. Kevin Carroll is the Vice President of Behavioral Health at Unity Point Health. We have Eric Cool, the director of Polk County Community, Family and Youth Services. Dr. Lena Mushra is the pediatric psychiatrist with uh, Unity Point as well, soon to be at Blank Children's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Kendra Perry, clinical director of outpatient behavioral health at Broadlands Medical Center. And Sergeant Jeremy Sprague with uh, Des Moines Police Department. He is in charge of a peer support group and peer support foundation as well. So we have a wonderful panel that's very excited to speak with you tonight. But first, First, Polk County Supervisor Angela Connolly could not be here with us tonight, but she did have a message about mental health during this difficult time. Good evening. Thank you to ABC5 for hosting tonight's COVID-19 forum and for your commitment to sharing this critical information to our residents. Tonight's discussion is focused on mental health. As many of you are experiencing, the COVID-19 pandemic is severely modifying the lifestyles and routines that we are accustomed to. We expect to see more individuals experience anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues in the coming days, weeks, and months. These issues are just as important as our physical health, and it is essential that we begin to address these issues now, given the fact that there will be a long and sustained response to this public health crisis. Here in Polk County, we have many programs to support our residents. We have recently established an extension on 211 that is specific to mental health needs and is staffed by mental health professionals. Simply dial 211 and choose extension 8. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, we want you to call 911 to access our mobile crisis unit. We have also made great progress in being able to provide telemedicine for mental health and counseling needs. This period of uncertainty can bring challenges that many of us haven't dealt with before. There are resources in our community to help ease those stresses. Our newly opened Financial Empowerment Center provides free financial counseling to help you manage rapidly changing budgets. We continue to provide food through various food pantries, and our congregate meal sites now offer drive through Polk County has recently expanded our general assistance program to include those at 150% poverty level to help with rent. All of those resources can be found at going to www.polkcountyiowa.gov. for that message. We appreciate your contribution tonight and what you are doing in the county to help the people who live here. And we do want to emphasize that we are talking specifically about some Polk County resources, but you're going to hear a lot of information that will help you wherever you live. So feel free if you're from outside of Polk County to join in on the conversation and submit your questions and share this with people as well who are outside of the county. I would like to start with opening questions of each of our panel members so we can kind of get a feel for what they're bringing to the table. And then after this, we will ask some more specific questions. So again, if you have a question at home, you may submit that at the number that we are running on the screen, 457-1026, or you can uh, check in on our Facebook page or We Are Iowa Facebook page and leave your questions there. Dr. Perry, I'd like to start with you tonight. Uh, we, with all the changes in our regular routines and social distancing, uh, many of us have may have a sense of prolonged fear or anxiety. Can you talk to us about some of the emotions that people might be feeling right now. First thing that's important to say is these are unprecedented times that we're living in and there's so much uncertainty right now and with that uncertainty it's completely normal to be feeling anxious or scared 
and social distancing that's being kind of forced on us, right, and being socially isolated just makes those feelings of uncertainty worse. Um, types of things people might worry about, this is a new situation, none of us have experienced this before, so that can induce anxiety. Um, wondering if cases are going to continue to rise or when we're going to hit our peak. Um, worrying about your own health and that of your loved ones, your financial situation, what your financial future looks like if it's been impacted, and or maybe how you'll manage school if another extended leave happens and your kids are home even longer than planned. Um, anytime we have that loss of control, which we certainly do right now, there's it's normal to feel scared and anxious and we're each trying to make sense um, and understand the situation. We're each processing it in our own way, um, but it's it's really hard with the current situation. It's constantly changing every day and it's worsening and that makes it difficult. Other common feelings, so besides fear and anxiety, are confusion. So you, maybe there's conflicting case projections you're seeing or watching excess news causing confusion, um, a sense of helplessness or sadness um, with the deaths that are occurring, celebrations on hold, events that are postponed or not happening at all, um, anger. And that can be at the restrictions in place, having to do this in the first place. Or maybe that's with somebody else who you feel like's not following the recommendations as they should be. Um, guilt over recent travel that you may have taken, and maybe guilt from being having to be away from family while you're distancing, and being overwhelmed with the amount, sheer amount of information that we're being presented with, um, what we're being asked to do, trying to keep up with it all. I mean, it can all just feel very mentally exhausting, and. An interesting one too is you might even have noticed yourself becoming hypersensitive to every cough and every sneeze around you or who's wearing a mask, why are they wearing wearing a mask and that's normal too. Um, and then feelings of loss or grief and I think you know if you think about it we're experiencing a lot of loss and part of that is um, a loss of our normal or what was normal and a loss of connecting with others, a loss of our sense of safety maybe um, and if anybody is needing to self-isolate, they can expect those feelings to intensify. Um, for individuals with pre-existing depression and anxiety, um, they're at increased risk for experiencing worsening symptoms. And so we just really want to emphasize continue your care as much as um, your typical treatment as much as you can. And if you need to speak with your provider about potentially increased visits. Most places are doing telemedicine visits right now and maybe it's been a while since you've sought treatment or maybe you've never sought treatment and it's not too late. Almost every place continues to accept new clients. So, Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Mishra, uh, the mental health of our young people is of course impacted by this. They're aware of what's going on around them or maybe they're not, but they notice that things have changed and that can be tough. Uh, tell us some of the signs or symptoms that parents or caregivers might notice in, in children of different ages. Right, as uh, Dr. Prairie already mentioned, I think all of us are feeling that sense of anxiety and apprehension that comes with the unknowns that are associated with this pandemic. Um, so some level of anxiety I think is very normal, just like all of us are experiencing, kids and adults. I think it, if it gets to the point that it's affecting your young children more physically, so if they're starting to have difficulties with sleep, or they're asking a lot of excessive questions, not responding to reassurance, being extremely fearful of death or dying or illness or almost to an obsessive level, um, if they're at that time, at that point that they're acting out more, I think those kinds of things should prompt more of a thorough assessment. Um, for older teenagers, they're able to verbalize their feelings a little bit better, so I feel like that gives you some openings to start those conversations with the kids who are willing to have those conversations. Um, I think the important thing to do in the middle of all of this is to build those connections with your kids so that they feel comfortable sharing their thoughts, emotions, feelings, talking about the uncertainty. Um, about the fact that even as adults, we don't have all the right answers. It's, it's okay to have those conversations. Um, you should validate your child's feelings no matter which age. Um, make sure that they're there for you because kids will again um, feed off that anxiety and stress. So if they see that the adults around them are stressed and, and reacting negatively, that's what they're going to feed off of. So keeping yourself as calm as you possibly can in the middle of all of this is helpful. Um, 
for yourselves to be calm, I think it's important to access the support and services that are out there. Keep connections with other people, even if you can't do them physically in person. Um, there's so many online tools that we have now that we weren't available to us 10 years ago, so access those services and support. And um, take care of your own mental health, too. And I say that to grown-ups as well as the children, because again, if you're not taking the time to take care of yourself, your kids are going to respond negatively to that. They will respond very well to that sense of calmness and control that comes from adults. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ms. Thompson, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a community-wide impact, and it is expected to continue. It seems like each day the, the, the goalpost gets moved. It, it feels like that. What suggestions do you have on what individuals we can do or even what we can do as a community to cope? Yes, um, we've been talking about grief and loss and the losses we're all experiencing with the changes that are being um, forced upon us because of this global pandemic. So some of the things that I've been thinking about is um, especially for high school and college seniors, they may be missing out on their graduation, their final semester at school, um, sports activities and other activities that um, our students aren't able to participate in, church, we can't gather to worship together. So there's many, many different ways that this virus is affecting us. And one of the things that has been really heartwarming for me to see is uh, different um, videos, for example, of people gathering on their balconies to applaud healthcare workers. Uh, there's other videos I've seen of hospitals where people have come to park and they put their flashers on and that's a sign to the staff that they're praying for their well-being. So there's many, many things that we can do as a community to support one another. And, and other fun um, examples have been uh, elementary school teachers who gather and do parades by driving their vehicles through their students' neighborhoods. And so there's lots of creative ways that I think we're seeing the community come together. And I think it's very important to seek new ways to do that, to counter the loss of ritual and tradition that support um, our sense of community and our sense of belonging in a time when we really need that. Lots of things we can find on our own. It mm -hmm. sounds like things that we can mine in our own lives yes. easily. Thank you so much. Sergeant Sprague with the Des Moines Police Department. We are going to talk a little bit about um, the first responder peer support group uh, that you are in charge of. What are some things that first responders are going through right now? Because we know that you have a very important job to do, but you're also living in this time of uncertainty like the rest of us. Yeah, and we're, we're all in this together, so we're, yeah. we're a part of this as well with everyone else, and we have our own, you know, our own families at home as well. So um, there's things that, uh, that is, as a peer supporter, we teach our recruits and our officers and first responders, um, but you know, we, we are used to bringing that calm to chaos whenever we respond to, to scenes. And we look for those physical threats, whether it be, you know, for a police officer looking for weapons, uh, firefighters looking at the type of smoke that's coming out of the structure. Um, but with this one, it's something that we can't see. And like you stated, we don't know when the, where that end is, that goalpost keeps moving. Um, so we have to adapt, and we're used to doing that uh, in, in times of, of stress. Um, but this prolonged stress does affect our first responders as well and the, and the medical professionals uh, in the hospitals that are trying to fight with this. Um, so with that stress, you know, we have kids at home and that, we're, that we care about. And the biggest thing that I'm hearing uh, around the state probably is, is first responders are, are glad to do the job and serve the communities, uh, but they are concerned like everyone else about their families at home and how do they protect their families. Uh, so practicing those good uh, those good uh, physical barriers that we use with the, the gloves and the mask and, and washing our hands. Um, but that has tend to lead, you know, the social distancing I think has led to distance, distancing ourselves from, from talking with people. And, and so I, I like the term physical distance better than social distance because we can still be, be social just a little farther apart. Um, so practicing some of those things is important. But if there are other resources out there for first responders as well, if, if they have child care needs, um, that uh, departments, and especially here in Polk County, have, have access to other housing for first responders. Uh, but you know those things are important uh, for their families. Uh, 
for the first responders themselves, just being able to take a break, uh, which can be hard if, if you're working a long shift, but take a break uh, from uh, from everything that's going on, uh, spend time with what's what's what matters most, which is you know our families and and our loved ones, and um, you know taking that break from. Uh, social media and all those other things that can can bombard us all the time. So a lot of the same things that work for everybody else works for us. We just, you know, wear a uniform, uh, but we still have the same. We're all like I said, we're all in this together. We still have the same emotions and feelings. So uh, those are some of the resources we have. Uh, we have peers throughout the state uh, that are first responders that are trained to talk to people, uh, to other first responders, and to kind of help them and guide them through this. Uh, and the last thing is if if someone's struggling. It's okay to reach out for help. It's okay to, to make that call or you know to a peer or a, a medical or mental health professional and say, hey, I'm struggling and I, I need some help. And that's, that's completely okay to do. Do you find that first responders tend to feel like they have to remain strong? We're, we're used to being in, in control. Yeah. And when we, when we lose that control, and I think this is with everybody, our anxiety increases and um, and we're used to that. Well, now we—it's harder to be in control of this. We—we we just can't throw handcuffs on it and take it to jail. Um, so it's something that—it's different for us. Um, but we have, you know, our training and our background to help with that. But yeah, it's, that lack of control does increase anxiety for for all of us. Um, but having the the right information and the right tools helps reduce that. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. We appreciate everything you're doing right now. By the way. Thank you. You and all the other first responders out there. Dr. Carroll, many in our communities are facing disruptions, if not everybody is facing a disruption in their daily routine, working from home, maybe schooling kids from home, um, maybe facing unemployment. These are stressful, scary things. What advice would you have for adults who are facing some really big changes right now? Yeah, as humans, uh, we are creatures of habit, uh, and we find a great degree of comfort in our habits, big and small. And those routines that we've all had uh, are upended uh, the past few weeks. And uh, it may sound uh, kind of trivial and small to say how you prepare for your day has changed or who's living at your house has you know, changed, but those can have a significant impact just on kind of overall mood throughout the whole day. What used to be a kind of routine with your coffee and your breakfast and heading out the door is now uh, sharing that pot of coffee with your college uh, daughter who's back in town while your spouse is in the other room on a video conference and your uh, other child is using up all the Wi-Fi playing video games. Uh, all these things, uh, again, sound trivial compared to the medical uh, crisis uh, that many in our community are facing at the moment, but for the majority of Iowans, those are a big uh, issue as well, and not to be minimized. And the number one thing people can do about it is just talk about it. Uh, if it's with your family that you feel comfortable, uh, with neighbors or friends, I agree that uh, we could physically distance, but we don't need to be detached from one another. Uh, find those loved ones that you care about and touch base with them. And ultimately, if you are experiencing some difficulties with all the changes, if your own job has been negatively affected, as the job numbers come out, we know that people are uh, applying for unemployment in our state and our nation. That's going to have a significant impact in the coming weeks and months, uh, and to reach out for help. And uh, we have resources here. Uh, there's a phone number 211 uh, that's available with a variety of resources. And it also has a warm line uh, for counseling where you can call and hit uh, you know, extension eight at the end of the message and talk to someone uh, about your specific concerns and get help and get referrals uh, for treatment if you need it. Is, is that an anonymous thing? So if somebody really just kind of wants to, to test the water but would like to remain anonymous, is that, is that how that works? Yep, and if people are nervous about that, just call it uh, and hear what it has to say and ask some questions. Say you're calling for a friend uh, and you're just checking out what resources are available if it doesn't feel comfortable the first time you're calling.
Thank you so much. I appreciate that resource, 211 Extension 8. And we'll repeat that a couple times tonight because it's very important that you know that and that you remember that number. Uh, we want to talk to Eric Cool now with Community Family Youth Services. Your agency provides services that can help ease the minds of those who may be worried about rent assistance, paying bills, or feeding their family, especially if they have recently become unemployed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you provide some details on these services and how people can get in touch with you if they need them? Yes. It's certainly true that food insecurity or financial uncertainty or housing uncertainty uh, is definitely, it definitely impacts mental health and, and health in general. And of course, we have a number of people in our community for whom that's a persistent state and they're dealing with that regularly. Uh, but even those who have been or currently are more financially stable, that, that anxiety of what could be and how it might affect their patterns uh, might get them to be thinking of some of these things for the first time and, and as well in impacting mental health. Um, so I would, I would echo as well that 211 is a really good resource for tangible items and, and assistance and referrals. Uh, Polk County specifically does offer a number of programs which I'll, I'll talk about and uh, provide some information about how to access those. Uh, the first one is that uh, is financial counseling and uh, individualized financial counseling is now available to any Polk County resident through a partnership between the Polk County Board of Supervisors, the Evelyn K. Davis Center for Working Families, which has long history in this work, and the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund. Uh, we have just started providing this service, um, and it's free as many times as needed. There are no strings attached. Uh, we encourage people to call. The main goals are to reduce debt, increase savings, increase access to banking, and increase credit scores. Uh, but, but the model of it really starts with a financial health assessment and looking at people's cash flow and uh, establishing a sustainable budget and looking maybe at trouble areas such as defaults or debts or evictions and, and trying to give some guidance on how to best navigate those issues. Uh, so that might be a really good resource for people who are um, already struggling or starting to anticipate how they might struggle in the future. And people can access that by going to empowermoney.org. That's empowermoney.org, and there will also soon be a direct link from the Polk County website. Uh, we also, through the Department of Community, Family, and Youth Services, Polk County provides a number of tangible um, programs, including emergency assistance in our general assistance program. And that is really primarily, it helps people who are at risk of eviction, low-income persons, um, get, get initial and, and emergency assistance to help them prevent uh, going out onto the streets. Typically, that's 100% of the poverty level, which would be net income. Uh, we've recently raised that for people affected by COVID-19 to 150% of the federal poverty level. And we would encourage people, if they believe they might qualify, or they're in a, they're in a need, uh, place of need, that they would uh, go onto the Polk County website under Community Family and Youth Services, access general assistance, and you can apply directly from that website. Uh, we also have a number of uh, really good food programs and uh, all of these programs uh, through Community Family Youth Services continue to be operating. We've, uh, we've modified how we're delivering services, but uh, our staff have done a wonderful job of, tr of uh, not disrupting that in a, and uh, making sure we get these services to people. Uh, congregate Meals for Seniors. So this is typically hosted within our, our uh, community centers. It's a very social environment inside. We're not having people inside right now, but those community site staff are delivering meals to registered congregate meal participants in the parking lot every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, they get a hot meal, uh, they get a warm hello and a nice smile, and uh, that's, that's been really important for, uh, for everybody. Uh, for people who can't make it to the site to get that meal, we can arrange for home delivered meals as well. We also have community meals at four of those sites on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and that's Norwoodville, North, West, and South, and those are from 1.30 to 2.45, and those um, are available to the general public. Again, we ask that people call and register so we know how many meals to plan for, and it's also delivered through a drive-up system. Neither of those programs are income restricted. It's open to the general public, and we would encourage people to get on the Polk County website, and you can search by the community sites that are closest and most convenient for any individual, uh, and call that number ahead and make a reservation. Uh, would re remind people that Supplemental Foods is a program we have that serves low-income seniors, 16 and older. Uh, typically, we have two ways of delivering that food, and it's a good-sized box of food to supplement 
uh, their regular resources. Uh, we generally have a store that people can come in and shop, as well as deliveries. Right now our store is closed, but we have uh, decided to deliver to every individual uh, personally, and so if anyone wants to access that, they can also get on that website. And then finally, our food pantries. We have two food pantries at the Northside Community Center and the River Place Food Pantry. Uh, those are both open. Northside is open from 8 to 10, Monday through Friday, and Riverside is open 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Uh, not, there's no income requirements. Anyone can come. We're not having people in the store, but we will give people and families uh, pre-bagged um, packages according to the size of their families and hand it out to them in the parking lot. Uh, if they're not registered already through the DMARC food pantry system, they can call uh, the 286-3695 uh, and get registered for that. Mm -hmm. Real quickly here, what, what would you say to somebody who's hearing all of these services that are available yet they're still too proud, they don't, they don't want to pull the trigger yet and take advantage? Uh, I, I would encourage them to come in. We have people from all walks of life come in. The food pantry, again, is not food restricted. The congregate meals is, is a very social environment, and people come for that as much as for food. Community meals is a good way to get out of the house, get a hot meal. I would say, you know, please don't, don't sense that this isn't for you. Uh, we really do want to reach people for lots of reasons. Thank you so much. I'd like to take a few of our viewer questions now. And again, because we're talking about mental health, we're keeping this completely anonymous. We're not using your names. So please don't let that stop you from asking your questions. And uh, Dr. Mishra, I want to start with you because this uh, has to do with children. It says, my 11-year-old son has an anxiety diagnosis and has been struggling with going outside by himself. How do I help him? I think if if some if, like your son, if there um, is if there's any child who's struggling with going outside during this time, for children it's really hard to understand all these social distancing requirements, particularly for some younger children. If he really needs your reassurance and support in order to go outside, please help him make those first steps. Because I feel like otherwise kids just end up very isolated in their home and unless you encourage them to expand their comfort zone and get out of their bubble, it's hard for them to do so. Um, that's what I would suggest as sort of the first step to, to getting outside, but absolutely. Uh, maybe those first couple visits you can, you can go with him and then encourage him to spend a little more time kind of away from you. Try to keep your physical presence there kind of limited and more available at the beginning and maybe sort of ease off on that and, and let kids go outside more by themselves as they get a little more comfortable for, to that routine. Um, you don't want that to become like a permanent thing that each time your child steps outside they feel the need to take you along. But I think at the beginning if he is really very anxious that's what I would do um, if I were in your shoes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, and I think Dr. Perry, I'd like to ask you that this, but then I might um, open this up for anybody else who'd like to comment on it first. But um, before the virus, I was already deep down the black hole. Now it's much worse. What should I do? So I think number one, I praise you for having the awareness that of of what was going on before, and that things have worsened. You know, we can't. Nothing can get better if we don't acknowledge what's happening, and so that's a huge step. That's step number one. Um, you know, if it kind of depends what deep dark hole means. Um, certainly, if someone's having thoughts of harming themselves or others, that's a mental health emergency, and you need to seek immediate help in in that instance. Um, I and I would encourage that person if you're not already established with care to get to get help to reach out. Um, if it doesn't feel comfortable calling that 211 that's kind of that initial um, in otherwise um, re reaching out to your established care provider and, and having your treatment continue as much as possible as it was before we don't want it to be it's going to be different over the phone or virtual visits but um, having that continued support with someone that you already trust is invaluable um, and like I said and if you if you haven't sought care yet that'd be and seek out a therapist and or psychiatric provider you mentioned telemedicine earlier, and that, I think that's a, a, something that some people might be familiar with, but it might be a new phrase to a lot of people. Can you walk us through what that would be like if somebody did use that service? Sure. 
And I think it varies kind of agency to agency. So some places are offering phone visits, like at Broadlands, that's primarily what we're doing right now is through the phone. Um, and we're gearing up to do telehealth, which for us is the video appointments. And other places um, we have maybe doing more of that or maybe doing entirely phone too. So that's where you're doing therapy and or checking in with your psychiatric provider over the phone or kind of imagine a FaceTime um, where you're, you're seeing your provider, you're at your home or pulled safely to the side of the road um, and having your appointment. Okay. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to address that question about what to do? Uh, we have another question here about um, non-custodial parents and, and how to balance that. Uh, I think, Dr. Carroll, I'd like to ask you about this, if that's okay. Uh, if you have young children with a non-custodial parent who lives a couple of hours away, should you continue to travel with these kids knowing that there will be many stops along the way? So again, this is that whole balancing the family juggling act that we're all going through right now. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, medically should be following the CDC guidelines and Iowa Department of Public Health about uh, uh, some of that. Uh, otherwise, about the relationship with your children and a spouse or former spouse, those are tricky to navigate uh, in the best of times, throw a uh, statewide crisis and those relationships can become frayed. Um, conversations and texts that we used to think and read that would be pretty innocuous. Maybe we read a little bit more into those and we get frustrated with our loved ones. Uh, and so good advice for everyone is uh, take a deep breath, uh, show as much grace uh, as we can to each other and understanding and patience. Uh, and then work it out with uh, that other, uh, you know, parent, or uh, and that's true for you know a lot of grandparents that are used to seeing grandkids, used to showing up for birthday parties, other celebrations. It was mentioned, you know, graduations or sporting events or spring concerts. Uh, there's just got to be a lot of, uh, you know, communication about those and our feelings about loss uh, and regret of those as well as we are a very resilient people. Uh, we'll certainly get through this, uh, but there will be some things that we, we miss, some big things and some little things, uh, like Iowa Cubs opening day. Uh, and if that's your favorite thing, uh, you can uh, you know, mourn that, uh, but move on. Uh, there's uh, bigger things happening now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mary, I would like to ask you something that I was, I was talking about earlier, and that is finding the joy in everyday life. And I understand that you have some strategies for doing that, because it's an easy thing to say that, oh, we'll just look for the positive. But if you're really feeling down, that can be hard to do. So where can somebody start? With that. There's a couple of things that I recommend. One is doing a gratitude journal. And I have a recommended format that I like to use for gratitude journals. Uh, and it's composed of three elements. So the first one is, and you just get a plain old piece of paper in the beginning of the day or the end of the day, whatever works better for you. List three things that you're grateful for. Um, it could be a thing, it could be an experience, it could be a person. Typically for me, it's a little bit of both. Some mornings it's I'm grateful for a good cup of coffee. Other days it's something more profound. Um, then the second thing to reflect on are three things that would make your day um, meaningful or special uh, and listing those out. Um, so it's setting an intention for how you would like your day to go. And then the third thing is to write down three positive attributes or characteristics about yourself. So what kind things can you say about yourself uh, to get you in um, a positive frame of mind? And another thing that um, some, um, sometimes people are, might be a little reluctant, I think there's growing acceptance of this, but uh, meditation is a very um, useful tool. We've been talking a lot about being able to detach a bit from the emotion of the moment and gather your thoughts and formulate maybe a different plan or approach. And what meditation teaches you is that ability to take that deep breath and step back, maybe uh, regroup your thinking and come up with a different approach. Uh, the other thing that I've really been um, enjoying lately are some of the humorous uh, videos. Um, I've kind of gotten addicted to TikTok and there's some really funny videos on there and I've had a lot of fun sharing those with people who I know would find things humorous. So my colleagues at the hospital, there's some very funny ones about 
the stress that we're facing in a medical setting, but they're very funny. So I share those with those folks and others I, I share with my um, young adult children. So uh, there's you have to look for those things to enjoy in life. You have to want to try to, or I recommend trying to find something to look forward to every day. So those are the, the three things that I think of right off the top of my head. All right, easy things we can all do. Mm -hmm. Start today with that. I'm gonna start a gratitude journal as soon as we're done here, because it sounds like something that would be fun to do. Um, another viewer question, Eric, this one's for you. Uh, is the Meals on Wheels option for seniors uh, just for Polk County? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, and then another question, uh, how can people help you with these programs? We mentioned the food pantry and some of these. Do you need volunteers or donations? How does that work? Yeah, that um, so many people ask that, and that's wonderful because our staff are really working very hard, and you know we've had to take all the same precautions other businesses and places have. So um, there, there is an opportunity to volunteer through the United Way, and uh, we can get that information to you. But um, Right now, we seem to be doing okay in terms of the volunteers we already had who are helping box up and, and bag up uh, the food and hand it out. So for now, we're doing okay, but as we get further in and need more volunteers, we can convey that through various means, including the United Way. All right, thank you very much. And Sergeant Sprague, a big question that we always see is people asking us how they can help how they can help first responders because we know people do like to feel involved and they like to be helpful. So what's something that you think people, everyday people could do to show support to first responders? Well, already we're seeing support. Uh, we've had people calling in and, and that have masks, leftover masks that they want to donate to first responders. And, and so that, that's great. We've had uh, um, food brought to the station. People have brought food to the station and, uh, to help feed those that are working. And, and all those things are great, but um, you know, we're, we're all going through this stressful time uh, and we've, we've, we've changed our operations uh, at our department and departments across the state. Uh, where uh, we may we may call you instead of coming to your house, and um, so those those things are, are changing for us as well. And it's kind of difficult. We just trying to be separated from somebody for six feet is actually kind of hard if you start thinking about it. Um, and so just be a little more patient because we may have to call you back in a few minutes, and or it may take another day to to get a call back to you. Um, but uh, you know, we we love the gratitude that that we're being shown. And uh, it, like I said, it's all, it's all a change for us as well in our operations. So um, the citizens of Des Moines and Polk County, you know, every time we've had something tragic happen in, in, here in, in the state, you know, people, people step forward and you see the love and compassion that you, uh, from the community. So that's great. Um, we get cards, a lot, a lot of cards coming into the station and uh, that, that is shared with all the employees. Um, so those, all those little small things uh, are, are really great. Um, but if you if you have any ideas, I would suggest calling down to the, the police station first and running that through our, our chief's office to make sure that uh, that's okay. Because again, we're taking precautions uh, at our place as well as, as agencies around the state. So we want to make sure that's okay before people go through that, that effort to help out. Because we don't need first responders having the added stress of, of maybe being exposed to the virus while they're working. Yeah, and we have that already. We just yeah. try to limit that as much as we can. Sure. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Perry, uh, another question that was brought to my attention. For somebody who maybe has been going along in life thinking that they were doing well mentally and now things have changed, what are, what are some warning signs that this isn't just something that a little self-care and some coping techniques will help? What, when do we know we need more than that? Sure. Um, if I think the two main things I think of are length of time and how someone is functioning. So, you know, we all have, we're humans, we have a wide range of emotions. It's normal to feel that, especially situational stress, um, stressors that we are experiencing, um, to feel sad, anxious. And we know it's normal when those feelings are time more time limited and when we're still able to do the things we're, we do on a daily basis, those obligations and responsibilities we have and um, keep up with our work or school um, and maintain our relationships. So some contrary or in contrast to that then is if it feels like you just can't shake it, um, it's it's now prolonged, it feels overwhelming, I can't switch gears out of it, what I normally do to cope isn't working, um, maybe I'm doing unhealthy things to try and cope, um, or if you're having 
like I said, difficulty. You're noticing things slipping in that day to day. So I'm, I'm, my change in functioning is, is reduced. So maybe I'm having, you know, decreased personal hygiene, or maybe um, troubles in relationships. Maybe my anxiety or depression, when it begins to affect those things, relationships in school or work, are are clues that it's probably time to seek help. Okay. Dr. Mishra, um, talking about children again, you know, my, my children were taught about this, uh, about coronavirus and COVID-19, a little bit in school. So they learned a little bit before we were sent home for spring break and then sent home indefinitely. So how much should we be talking to our kids when they're curious? And, you know, is there kind of a threshold for how much information we should be giving them and what type of information we should be giving them? So usually I'll tell most people that make sure that your facts are accurate. So um, there's so much uh, news or little blogs on the media and, and some of the information is inaccurate or overemphasizes the negative aspects. So I would probably um, check reputable sites. So you want to look at um, like Polk County website or like if you're looking specifically for the information about virus, I would say CDC or WHO would be like reputed. What they say is accurate. Um, if you're looking for like more like mental health um, topics related to the virus and its impact uh, physically on young people, then I would probably check, uh, let's say, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, ACAP.org. Free website. It's got multiple different resources. It gives you um, strategies and topics to talk about with younger kids and what kind of language to use, as well as with older kids. So that's anybody can access it. You don't have to be a member. They have facts for families as well as facts for children themselves. So anybody can go on that and check. Um, I would say for younger kids, you want to simplify the language as much as you can. So keep it very focused on germs because most younger kids are familiar with germs and hand washing. So continue to emphasize those aspects and explain that it's just a new germ and we're st still learning about it along the way. For older kids, I think you can be a little more technical about what, what exactly that means and why there's so much um, uncertainty and fear associated with, with it because we don't have a good understanding of it. It's new. It's new for, for all of us. Um, so, and then listen to your child's signals about that. If you feel like it's overwhelming and too much information, then back off on that and maybe come back to that later. Um, give it in little bits and pieces. You don't want to overload them with a lot of information, um, and you don't want to sort of leave them out there listening to, uh, you know, information that's not accurate. So kind of find that balance or that line to walk in between. Um, and then continue to reassure and I would say don't don't give false reassurance. Like don't 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 tell them facts that are not true because they're they're bound to find out one way or the other, and you might as well be honest with them. If you if if it's unknown, then it's okay to say it's unknown. We don't know right now, but there are a lot of people out there who are trying to work on trying to find the answers for us. And one day we'll have them. It's just not today, maybe. Mm -hmm. And on the tail of that, how important is diet and exercise to a child's mental health right now when we don't have the typical routine going? So as uh, Dr. Carroll mentioned, we're all definitely creatures of habit and children are the same. Uh, without a, a schedule or some kind of support during the day, it tends to um, make most people feel anxious and kids are included in that too. So whatever you can do to set up a somewhat semi-normal schedule would be really helpful at this time. So I know with uh, a lot of the people I've been talking to over the last week or two, many parents are keeping sort of like a study time during the day where they work on math and reading given that schools out and they don't want them to lose completely all the skills that they've worked so hard to acquire this year but also keeping lots of fun things along the way so you know a little bit of cooking in the middle of the day definitely some time outside uh, keeping some TV some fun time as well I know we have we spent so much time talking about spending too much time on electronics but right now, I feel like it's not the right time to be overly rigid about that. We're just in a place that was unprecedented. And three months ago, my answer would have been different. But right now, do what you need to do to get through the day. Uh, pick some family-friendly things that you can all watch together. Um, consider this like a staycation for some people, because I know as a, as a working mom myself, there's just never been enough time to do all these things and watch all these shows. Now's the time to do all that stuff. So celebrate this time that you have together and make it as positive as you possibly can.
I think I just felt a load of parents <laughs> breathe a sigh of relief, especially <laughs> at the relaxed screen time suggestions because, you know, it does seem to help give them a little break if they use it wisely. So it plays a role in our day now. Right. What they were saying from um, some of the news reports and the information I read online was in other countries that's what was happening. So like older teenagers, they ended up going outside more and kind of not following the social distancing guidelines because they were so horribly bored at home. Um, and, and I'm hearing that a lot this week too from a lot of the teenagers I'm talking to. I'm bored. Mm -hmm. There isn't a whole lot to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame them because we're all feeling that pressure. So finding um, ways to utilize that time in a, in a healthy way and in taking advantage of uh, having the time to s smell the roses along the way right now is, is important, I think. Very nice. Thank yeah. you so much. Mary, we talked about some of those unhealthy habits that maybe we joke about having right now, but you know, we can cross the line pretty easily. I'm talking about you know, the alcohol use, uh, you know, maybe picking up a poor diet, we, uh, gaining a little weight or not exercising. Can you talk to us about that and how we can stay on track with, with our, our health, physical health as well? I think one of the themes that you know, we're exploring here is the benefit and the um, um, helpfulness of having a routine and, and habits. And I think uh, people tend to fall into unhealthy habits when there isn't that routine and structure. So as much as you can without um, going overboard in terms of being rigid with your scheduling, being somewhat generous with the screen time and relaxing some of standards you may have had previously, um, but yet at the same time holding yourself to healthy habits. Um, uh, one of the concerns I've had is there's been a lot of um, uh, joking about um, substance use during the day when you're working from home, not getting dressed, you know, eating too much. And I think, again, there's a balance between, you know, of course, we want to relax and, and rejuvenate ourselves a little bit. But if that becomes a habit or a routine, you need to be aware that you may be slipping into some habits that might be hard to pull back once we um, come through to the other side of this. So just be mindful of how much your alcohol you're drinking or how much overeating you're doing and uh, try to balance that. Okay. Unlike a vacation, you know, that usually lasts a week, oh, this right. we have a kind of a, a loose ending here to this one. Um, how about this? How, how to find balance between staying informed and information overload? You know, as a news agency, we understand that sometimes too much information isn't healthy for somebody. I think one of the most important things you can do to manage anxiety, and we were discussing this as a group before we came online, there are some news sources that, are, that keep a running tally of the cases and the number of deaths, and for me that's very hard to watch. Um, I think you have to know yourself and what type of information is reassuring to you and when that crosses the line to being distressful. And I generally would suggest you pick one or two news sources that you feel comfortable with, that don't increase your anxiety, that you can trust, and you rely on those news sources. And that's a way to stay informed without being overwhelmed, which is really tricky right now in terms of the amount of information that's being provided to us. Um, and people can get into obsessive habits around checking um, how many new cases, have there been deaths, hospitalizations. So I would really encourage people to pick one or two sources and try to maintain um, kind of a fidelity to those sources and, and um, helping use that to balance um, over being overwhelmed. Thank you very yeah. much. Dr. Carroll, I'd like to ask you this question. This is of your submission. It says, I am a nursing home administrator. What suggestions do you have to keep morale up of elderly individuals who have to be socially restricted to their rooms? Dining and activities have to occur in their rooms. Uh, they sit and watch news all day and they become worried. Their anxiety increases. How can staff help ease this anxiety? It's a great question, and whether it's in one of those care settings or, again, a patient in isolation uh, at the hospital, uh, all of our usual comforts aren't there. Uh, in those cases, our, our family and friends can't visit, uh, and so I would pick up on some of the themes from earlier. Maybe if the staff at that care center uh, can return to talking to the patient about what things they do enjoy, uh, maybe away from some of the TV and news. It could be things as simple as music and coloring and activity books, uh, finding time to FaceTime or talk with loved ones uh, are great ways to spend time. But undoubtedly, it is a challenge. We're social people as well, and when that's taken away and you don't have those kind of dining room options, 
uh, you know, it is a struggle when there's a, a long day every day for caring for those residents um, and lean on other administrators. Um, this has been a time when lots of professionals have been very active through email and listserv, sharing ideas. Uh, any competitive nature that once existed has really gone down as everyone is being very collaborative in our community uh, to seek the best outcome for the state and for Polk County. Thank you very much. Dr. Perry, this is another question that was just submitted. And this has to do with hobbies, things that we enjoy doing. Coping with changes in daily routine while homebound, but how do we fill the time with our cherished hobbies, like framing or artwork when it's not safe to go out to the art stores or the supply stores are closed? How can we keep up with those important things? That's a good question and undoubtedly tough. I think. Now is kind of the time, not only for for many different things, but to brainstorm. How, how can I meet that need? Do I have supplies I can dig from a tote in the basement that maybe I hadn't looked at in two years? Or um, I think online also is another great resource, and maybe you can do it, but in a different way. So I'm just thinking about scrapbooking, for instance. While it's fun and tangible in person, and I and that would be ideal. You know, maybe you make an online Shutterfly or you know one of those agencies uh, scrapbook in in that way, where you're still able to add your personal touches, and it is it's scrapbooking. It's just done in a different way, and I think it's so important to continue to make time to do those things. That's how that's good for your mental health. That's good for all of us to be doing on a on a regular basis. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sergeant Bragg. I want to ask you this question. You know, we talk about first responders a lot, but the spouses and, and family members of first responders are, play a big role in the job. So how can they each watch out for each other's mental health? What are things that they should be watching for in each other? Well, I think if you watch for the signs of stress, uh, I think that we've already talked about um, within within our spouses, uh, within our family members, uh, that's you know those things of increased anxiety. Uh, you might see a little more irritability between relationships right now and um, but trying to have open communication I think that more communication can be better and no matter what realm we're in uh, but sharing concerns is they have noticed some changes in you and this is a stressful time uh, you know what's this been like for you uh, and trying to just understand each other's uh, you know and have some empathy with each other can be can be very helpful um, and being open and, and talking Dr. Carroll talked about just talking about uh, what we're going through in those emotions and talking is one of the best ways um, to reduce stress and just sharing those emotions sharing those thoughts uh, with someone trusted um, by keeping an eye out on each other uh, our first responders are are making changes uh, to when usually when they go home I hear uh, people they, they take off their clothes in their garage they put it right in the washing machine um, jump in the shower and try to limit their exposure to their family and those are different those are changes that are happening at home and um, because of the, the stress that's going on uh, but being open and honest and and talking with our spouse and what we're doing to protect ourselves and what I'm gonna do to protect my family uh, from this uh, just having that open dialogue and communication is is really important Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here. And uh, Mary, I think I'll ask you this one. It says, should I only be staying home right now? Or is it okay to get out and exercise? Uh, I, we of course have to follow our government recommendations, but one thing that's been constant even um, in the more restricted areas is that exercising um, alone is a recommendation. And I, I think it's very important right now, and I think we're so fortunate. I've had this conversation with different uh, groups of friends, how fortunate we are that this is happening in the spring, mm -hmm. because we're seeing the grass green, the trees are about ready to leaf out. Um, but I would really encourage people to maintain some type of exercise routine. Walking is the simplest thing you can do, and it's very grounding. Um, I like to run, running is great. It's bike, biking season is here now. But I would also ask that you follow the recommendations and that you, you exercise by yourself. Okay, mm -hmm. simple enough. Yeah. But it yes. helps, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I mean, it's the, the hardest part usually of exercising for most people is getting out the door. So the hardest part of any outdoor activity sometimes, especially when you're feeling stressed, is just to make that, to open the door and step outside. But yeah. once you do, two minutes into the walk, 
the run, the bike, you're gonna feel great. So organize yourself so that you can make it easy for that to happen. I've always said you never regret exercising no. when it's done. Sometimes you regret not doing it, but well, the body holds regret. stress, yeah. and you know, uh, exercise is a great way to release that stress. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. I like this one, Dr. Carroll. I'm going to give this one to you. It says, "How should students who are forced to move home deal with their parents?" <laughs> and I like that one because we're keeping the humor alive tonight. <laughs> you know, there have been lots of changes, and so uh, yeah. Speaking to the young adult crowd uh, that have gone off to college uh, and are back unexpectedly, uh, depending on what year they're at in school, uh, that can feel maybe a bit like a prison sentence. I had all this freedom. Mm -hmm. My parents really didn't know what I was doing or who I was doing it with or when, and now I'm back and there's some benefits. But oh my goodness, uh, they ask me all these questions, where I'm going, always checking in on me, uh, and that can be a real, uh, you know, upsetting and certainly a big change for everyone. Uh, the universities, some of them are not going back, and so it's not a matter of you know waiting till next month. This is kind of summer is here for those uh, students, even though they're going to school. Like all the others, I think, uh, you know, talking about it openly, uh, setting new expectations and boundaries about all those hot button issues, you know, noises, uh, sharing, uh, you know, in the home uh, are good ways to do it. And uh, to, to do it with a sense of humor uh, as well. Um, those young adults are trying to, uh, you know, adult, uh, but they also need some TLC themselves and some support. Uh, and I, I appreciate the question. I like that question too. And here's another one that kind of flips the roles. What's the best way to talk to our parents? Maybe they're older than, you know, they're a little bit older and they shouldn't be going out, but they're independent. We're asking them to stay home and they feel like they can handle anything and they don't have to stay home. So how do we approach that conversation with them, but let them keep their dignity as well and remain the parents. <laughs> You know, having uh, parents and in-laws in town, I can relate to this question. I'm beginning to wonder if my wife is sending these questions in. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, a great measure. Uh, we're very lucky in Iowa to have a lot of our family nearby uh, and uh, can relate to them over the phone and through uh, other communications. And those daily you know, contact points mean a lot. Uh, sometimes we see our friends and family, including our older parents, do things uh, two months ago that we didn't like, and they're doing things, you know, today, uh, two months that uh, we think maybe aren't following the guidelines. Uh, one of the core beliefs of social work is to, you know, respect autonomy and people's, you know, opportunity to make choices in life. Uh, that's what we value so dearly. And so I think. Uh, showing uh, and sharing some of the guidelines uh, and uh, show, displaying your concern. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, people can do what they want uh, unless uh, <laughs> law enforcement is gonna say otherwise <laughs> or our governor and uh, just to take it in stride knowing that this is not uh, forever either. Sure. Uh, Eric, I wanna ask you this question. For the people that you serve, your clients, what kind of change in their mental health do you see after they have come in spoken to somebody and had some of these huge stressors relieved or helped? Yeah, you know, we see a lot of uncertainty. The processes that they're familiar with are different. The uh, the interaction they have with our staff that can, be so, that can be so rewarding in and of itself is changed a little bit. So there's a lot of apprehension and uncertainty. Um, but I, I think when people realize they're still getting uh, the basic service and they're still getting some of that affirmation and that human contact even if it's much briefer uh, What we're getting is it's just still a real valuable service we're providing in terms of food or um, or You know even the financial counseling and I would like to if I could about the financial counseling I, I neglected to say earlier that uh, This is a model that typically is done in person. We are doing it on phone now I mentioned that about our other programs, but this is the same. We're not doing it in person right now um, so when people schedule an appointment, it will be by phone. And, and the other part about that is, uh, while we might be able to help people get what we call quick wins, if there's really urgent matters that people are struggling with, we may be able to have some impact on that. Uh, but we really hope it's a, it's a purposeful, deliberate process that helps sustainable practices and helps people reach their goals, such as you know, home buying or getting out of debt or what it might be. And I just didn't mention that earlier. I wanted to get that across.
appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. I did have a question um, that was directed at you, Dr. Carroll. How can people at home support the medical community? Because we know you are also in this with us and, and you're living in uncertain times as well. That's a great question. And uh, for all the institutions that are represented uh, here today, uh, we're typically thinking of uh, frontline uh, individuals uh, law enforcement and fire and EMS, uh, but today that does include all of our medical professionals and individuals working at hospitals and clinics. Um, my encouragement is if you have uh, the time to send an email, uh, to write a letter of support, to some way express uh, your appreciation for the dedication, the fearlessness, and the courage that so many are doing as they walk into these institutions every day to care for other people, uh, that would be much appreciated. Well, I, I wanna thank you all for being here with us tonight and for the work you are doing. Unprecedented times, but we are, we are happy to rely on you and your expertise. So thank you very much. And thank you at home for joining us tonight and submitting your questions. We want to keep the conversation going, so continue to submit those uh, to our Facebook page. We are, our we are Iowa Facebook page, and you can also text them to 457-1026. Uh, and we will try to continue to answer your questions on mental health and anything else that you would like to know about COVID-19 right now. With that, again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great night.